Good afternoon, Europe. I'm Carsten Schradin. I'm a researcher at the Sinois in Strasbourg and a co-organizer of the seminar series. It's a pleasure to have all of you here um, this today again for the next um, fine seminar. And I have a few um, technical announcements I would like to make before we start. First, to give you a short overview, we have already two, more than 200 registered um, participants. There's always more than 100 um, listening to us on Zoom or YouTube, and it's a very good audience. And we had lively discussions, and I would like to thank everybody um, for being here for, and for coming back and contributing. We see that most participants are from North America or from Europe. We have few from Africa and, and Asia. So if you have any colleagues that are interested to join us, please let them know about um, the series. So this is then especially for the people that are so far only joining us on YouTube. If you want to subscribe to the seminar such that you get weekly reminders then send an email to either one of the three organizers, myself, Lauren or Eduardo. You don't have to send it to all three of us, just to one and we will put you on the list and you will get um, every week an email actually twice emails about the upcoming um, lectures. Now, last week we had a problem that some people that could um, link in at the Zoom meeting for the first talk couldn't come for the second talk. And we have to know we are three different organizers with three different um, security settings at Zoom. And we believe the reason is that at Yale University only people are allowed in that have an actual Zoom account. With Zoom, it's possible to also join a meeting without having a Zoom account, but not all platforms allow this. So if you want to be sure that next week at a very interesting talk of Aaron Sandel, you will be allowed in, please um, sign up for Zoom. It's for free. It takes only a few minutes. And we hope that then the problem will be solved. Um, another point I quickly want to mention, a student asked me already some weeks ago and I didn't reply, so I reply here to everyone, if she could get a certificate of attending the fine seminar series to get some credit points at the university. I didn't reply, so I didn't have a good um, solution for this then, but I think I found a solution. Um, if you want to get this certificate, you should register for fine, which means send an email, and if you get a reminder, you know you're registered. You must, of course, also participate. And please send an email to this email address here, social.evolution.seminar at gmail.com, asking to register to get a certificate. And then for me, the question was, how do I really check whether people were there or not? I mean, I cannot check 200 names during the seminar. So what I just did with my students last year when I was teaching for Zurich, they had to write a short and summary. So I would then also ask the students who want this certificate to write a very short summary, send it to this email address so I know they have been there. So just we know you attended. For example, if you listen to Lauren's talk last week, you could just write to me that you found out Degos are cuter than striped mice. Degos are more interesting than striped mice. And that most important, multi-generational studies are important to test theory, but also to develop new theory. So just write three key points, send it to me. It's a good learning exercise for you. And I don't have a bad feeling writing this certificate for you. And at the end of the autumn term, you will get a letter from me stating that um, you have been participating to 10 out of 12 and fine seminars. And then you have to find out what your university gives you for this. I think that's a good solution. I don't expect there will be hundreds of students, but the ones who can benefit from it via this way, and if you can, you should, and um, can use it um, via the way described here. Now, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, um, that is um, Eduardo Fernandez Duque. And um, I only met Eduardo beginning of this year, actually, first via email, and then when we started the seminar series in what we call the core group in July, which is surprising because I did my PhD on New World Monkeys on Calitrichide. And while I was working on them, that was the last, not even the last decade, the last millennium that I finished my PhD. I was wondering why is nobody looking at these very interesting old monkeys in South America that also supposed to be pear living, but nearly nothing was known. And in, fa in fact, while I was thinking, so Eduardo was spending a lot of time in the um, rainforests or the tropical forests of Argentina, exactly um, studying these interesting species and finding very interesting results about which he will tell us today. So it's um, 
a real pleasure for me that, to finally have met him and to hear today about these fascinating animals where I was always thinking somebody should study them. And luckily that's what Eduardo has been doing for a long time. So Eduardo, he's originally from Argentina where he got a biology degree from the University of Buenos Aires in 1988. Then he came to the US where he got his PhD at the University of California in Davis in 1996 and later became a postdoctoral fellow of the Smithsonian Institute at Harvard University and together with the Zoological Society of San Diego. And in 2006, he got a tenure track position at the University of Pennsylvania. And he left there in 2014 when he was appointed by Yale University to be a professor in the Department of Anthropology. Eduardo has more than 140 publications, more than 3,000 citations, and apart from all um, these um, paper, papers in, in journals, he's also at the moment very busy editing a book. He's the only editor on Autos, the genus of, of all monkeys, the guys you see down here with 25 chapters, 56 contributors. And I can tell you, I once edited a small special issue with much less chapters and less people. This is a hell lot of work to get something like this done. And I'm sure it's going to be a very exciting and fascinating book for everybody interested in um, behavioral ecology. He trained more than 140 American students from the US, plus 145 from Argentina, and 33 students from other countries. Also showing how this long-term project has been running on all monkeys and also does a lot for training of students from all over the world. He applied and that's interesting in his um, CV, he doesn't only write how many grants he got, but also for how many he applied. He applied for 160 major grants and got about half of them, which I think is an extraordinarily high success rate. Maybe also showing um, the long, young colleagues that if you want to get money, it's really like getting blood out of a stone. If I would be happy if every second of my grant proposals would be accepted. And it's really hard work to get um, money for field work on, on um, monkeys or whatever species. And he got this from different foundations that you see here. And um, yeah, that, that's, well, I, I missed something. Where do I have, I had this, this I had missing a slide about his research topics. It's about pair bonding, about mating strategies, but also about diurnal, diurnal, diurnality because um, these monkeys typically are um, nocturnal, but the uh, one population he studies is diurnal. So he's also working on a huge different range of um, research topics. And he has been doing this long-term research on the Aotus, on the old monkeys um, since um, 1996, so for a very long time. And since I think 2006, if I remember it right, he's also collaborating on a long-term project in Ecuador that um, looks at other pair living monkeys, at Saki monkeys and Titi monkeys. I don't know whether we hear anything about them um, in our talk today. But I'm looking very much forward to a very um, interesting and fascinating um, talk by, by Eduardo today on, on the old monkeys and the floaters. And with this, I'm handing over to you, Eduardo. You've already made me a co-host, correct? So I think I can share my screen. Yes. Lauren, I'll be keeping an eye on you for any disasters that may happen. So you see my screen, everything's fine. It's my, you guys, everyone can see my screen. Yeah, okay. Well, a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever you are. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for a Lauren and Karsten for inviting me to join you in the organizing of the seminar. It was really, I understand Karsten's idea followed by Lauren and they were very kind to suggest that I join them and I'm really benefiting a lot from helping them co-organize it and for attending it. So I really thank them for that. I don't really thank them that much for the wonderful two talks they gave initially because they have kind of set up the bar quite high. So it's a nice challenge to have and I hope I'll be, I'll stand up to it. Like Carson described today, I wanna to be talking about the great unknown what we do not know about floaters in pure living sexually monogamous primates. 
I have structured the presentation around two central topics. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the study of sociality in peer living primates as it relates to the central theme of the Frontiers in Social Evolution seminar, which has to do with understanding the evolution of sociality in all kinds of animals. And I will be specifically talking about what we have learned about one single peer living taxon, which is the owl monkey. And then the second part of the talk, I will be focusing on floaters. And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that uh, in about 10, 15 minutes. So uh, I've been thinking about peer living tax. I've been thinking about social systems that we used to describe as monogamous. We now call somewhat different for quite some time. Here I am using uh, Peter Kapler's way of depicting the way in which can graph social systems, which he did early on with Carol Van Schaik in the 2002 paper that we have discussed in the previous meetings. I am just adjusting their version of this way of thinking of social systems as they apply to peer living taxa. And the reason I want to do it with those cute little drawings that my colleagues, uh, Tony Di Fiore and Sari Van Bell put together is because this is the first talk that's going to be focusing on primates. And primates have done some interesting contributions to the study of sociality. I think that one of the things that makes them different, or at least that makes us primatologists different in how we approach the study of social system, that quite consistently across many taxa and regions of the world, we have tried to focus on studying all components of the social system. And that's what I will be describing to you today, not just the social organization, but as well social structure, mating system, and care system. Of course, not all are benefits of studying primates. There are many difficulties and limitations that come with studying primates. One of them is that they tend to be relatively long species, and that poses a challenge. We keep talking about long-term projects when we refer to the study of primates sometimes not being clear to the audience that what we mean by long-term may not be necessarily long-term if we were open about the duration of the lifespan of a single individual. If you join us last week, you heard how Lauren can go through generations of Daegu on a yearly basis. You couldn't do that with any primate species that I know of. So I, I have been thinking about peer living taxa for some time. It all started back when I was doing my PhD dissertation. Karsten mentioned that I worked at the UC Davis Primate Center. I was a student in the animal behavior group. And under the guidance of Bill Mason and Sally Mendoza, I began exploring male-female relationships in captive monkeys, in captive TD monkeys. And I really want to thank them. I think that's so much of what drives me today eh, with regards to the kind of research that I do really started working under their guidance. When I finished the PhD, I started the Almaki project in Argentina. I did not have a very diverse menu of primates to choose from if I wanted to go back to Argentina. In Argentina, we have only four primate taxa, but I was lucky that there was one which people had said there had been a very brief preliminary studies of Almakis in Argentina, suggesting that they were monogamous. So we traveled back to Argentina in 1996, and the area where I settled down to develop the project is the South American Gran Chaco. I usually see eyes going big and open when I put perspective to the size of the Gran Chaco. For those in the US, it's about the combined size of Texas and Arizona. For those in Europe, it's about four times the UK. So this is a large biome. It's the second largest biome in the Americas after the Amazon. And I went to northern part of Argentina, the province of Formosa. We're barely in the subtropics. We're at, at about 25 degrees south. Now, owl monkeys, as Carson mentioned, in most of their distribution, they are strictly nocturnal. Aeotus as a genus, as a primate genus, is the only genus of primates in all of the Americas that has any kind, any amount of nocturnal activity. Anywhere from Panama down to northern Bolivia, they are strictly nocturnal. And that's really what has limited 
the ability of colleagues to make progress, much progress in understanding their behavioral ecology, the challenges of working with them exclusively at night. But when you come to the South American Chaco, in these few minutes, I'm hoping that we will have people interested in circadian biology and chronobiology in the audience. I'm talking specifically to you and I'd be delighted to go into some more detail during the questions and answers. When you go to the South American Chaco, this genus, now a new species in that part of the world that is strictly nocturnal in the rest of the continent, shows activity day and night. And what I'm showing you on the right side of the slide, it's what chronobiologists called a, 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 an actogram, a dual plot actogram. And I wanna walk you slowly through it because it is so rich on data. What happens is that you capture an individual and you fit it with one of those devices that so many of us are using these days to know how many steps we take and whether we can eat the next slice of, of cheesecake. So you fit them with that little device and the device records activity automatically and continuously. So the graph is showing the pattern of activity of a single owl monkey, wild owl monkey out of 10 that we fitted with those devices and how much activity the animal showed during 160 days, that's the y-axis, day number one on top, day 160 at the bottom, during the course of 24 hours. So we have noon on the left end of the x-axis and in the middle here you, we have midnight. If you think of the, of the dark blotches as a bouts of activity, what is very clear that this individual during these roughly five months showed most activity primarily at, do, at dusk around 800 hours and dawn around 600 hours. But it also showed activity at all times during the day. Yeah, in this graph for this period, it seems like it showed more activity during the morning hours between 600 and noon than it did between noon and 1800. This is my guess is that this is probably a summer day and the animals slow down in the afternoon. This also shows you, usually if they talk weird about chronobiology, I would be inviting you to guess what these beautiful diagonal bands are. These diagonal bands are unequivocal evidence that this owl monkey was profoundly influenced by moonlight. What happens is that over the course of the nights that we go from a growing moon, from a waxing moon to a full moon to a waxing moon, the moon changes the time it rises and the animal follows the rising of the moon with its activity. So all of this allowed us, I mean, the, the, the activity that the animal shows during the day and, and primarily during dawn and dusk allowed us to do most of what I would summarize to you uh, next. Everything I've done, I've done thanks, like Kirsten was mentioning, thanks to a huge group of people. There are some people that I want to mention explicitly. Marcelo Rotundo, he's been, without any doubts, a key, key player maintaining the field project. Marcelo has been working with us for 20 years. Many of you know Claudia Valeja, my wife and colleague, who has been with me since the very first day when we set up tent in the forest of White Collect with our two boys. We only had two at the time. Alba Garcia has been with the project for now about six years. She's completing her PhD, University of Barcelona. Cecilia and Victor were instrumental during the first 10, 15 years of the project. They have now go, go on onto developing their own careers at the local University of Formosa. What have we done? I, I really wanna, of course, we're very proud of this. And that's why I take a minute to share a little bit the scope of our field efforts and our sampling efforts, which uh, I was discussing with some of you. This is a year round project. We have permanent presence in the field. And we have been collecting rainfall data. The ranch was since 1997. Hourly temperature. We have hourly records to really be able to understand the activity patterns of the animals. We have described the forest structure and composition of about 60 hectares, roughly 9,000 trees. We collect monthly phenology data from roughly 300 trees, and we're looking at the fourth generation of identified individuals. By identified, I mean that ours has been the first project 
ever anywhere on our monkeys, looking at animals of known sex, unequivocally identified sex, and known date of birth. Regarding the data that we'll be presenting, uh, we try to collect demographic data, meaning that we contact the group and we get basic information about birth, death, disappearances from anywhere between 20 and 30 groups. It's variable, you know what I'm referring to, it depends on so many factors. Behavioral data comes usually from within eight and 10 groups that we study more, more intensively. And over the course of the years, we have managed to get life history data, longitudinal data, so that we can do individual based studies, quoting some of our colleagues on more than 170 individuals. Of course, I look at that 170 and Lauren was telling us that he captures about 130 Jago, or was it the strike mice? Well, either Lauren or Karsten. I mean, though our numbers without monkeys uh, get really, I mean, well, that's what we can do when you're capturing monkeys running on top of a tree. Much of our research over all these years has been focused in trying to understand why are all monkeys monogamous? This is a question that belongs in much literature that most of you are familiar with. I mean, why do we see monogamy at all in mammals? Why and how has monogamy evolved in primates? And recently we published, together with my colleagues, Maren Hook, Sari Van Bell, and Tony Di Fiore, two reviews looking at the progress we have made on this topic. For the owl monkeys, we have primarily evaluated the infant care hypothesis, the female distribution hypothesis, and the infanticide prevention hypothesis. I'm not gonna go into those details, but I wanted to mention them in case there's interest and time during the questions and answers to go back to what we have learned about how the evidence supports more or less those different hypotheses. What I wanna do leading to the central topic of the floras is just to give you a synopsis of what we have learned about pure living in our monkeys. Without any doubts, they are pure living and they're sexually monogamous. And that applies to every single study done on every single owl monkey across the continent. People have never reported more than one infant present in the group, unless a couple of times when people have reported more than one, and it's usually infants of exactly the same size. We know now that every so often they have twins. But every, everywhere you go, what you find is what is illustrated by this photograph of this cute group with a pair of adults who will actually sleep in the center, surrounded by juveniles and sub-adults, and the young infant who is the second starting from the right. In the case of the Almanke population in Formosa, we have data showing that at least for the data we analyzed, what else can I say, that they're also genetically monogamous. And I'll come back to that later. So that single male and single female who are the adults in the group have infants. In Formosa, they have infants once a year, and when the infant is born, mom and adult male in the group, I'm not calling it the father, take care of that infant. Now, both for owl monkeys and titty monkeys, I cannot think of any other mammal, definitely not any other primate, where the, the form of paternal care that we see is as extreme as it is with owl monkeys. Sometimes when I give uh, lectures to, to uh, general audiences, I really make them think of male owl monkey and male TV monkeys as the seahorses of mammals. The male takes care of the infant from the first few days of life. It's the primary carrier of the infant, shares food with the infant, goes to the rescue of the infant when the infant is calling in distress because suddenly it didn't realize that the canopy gap is wider than it can handle. And so the male goes and offers his back and crosses the infant across the gap. So very, very intense, consistent, systematic care provided by the male of the only infant born in the group. The, infant, the infants grow, they become juveniles, they become subadults. And as shown here in this survival curve, about half of them 
have dispersed, here I mean the, the y-axis is showing the proportion of individuals remaining in the negative group, roughly about half of them have left the group when they're roughly 36 months or about three years of age. So if we wanted to just limit ourselves to measures of central tendency, which we have done, we were not being very thoughtful, we would just claim that males and females have about the same median age at dispersal, which is roughly over, of about three years. I wanna mention that Maggie Corley, who completed the PhD at University of Pennsylvania, has been a primary researcher focusing, studying, advancing our understanding of natal dispersal and the mechanisms leading to natal dispersal. You can see that th there's a lot of richness in the data, regardless of what the medians may say, that we, the, there's here at, at, at both ends of the distribution, there are things that we are pondering. It looks like females, I mean, we have a few females who tend to stay longer, almost five years before they dispersed. Whereas at the other end, what we see is that it is males, quite a few males between eight and 10 who dispersed before they turned three years of age. They disperse and what happens after, oh, I'm sorry, they disperse. Something else that, that, it, it, that paints the general picture of peer living and monogamy in our monkeys is that as expected, we did not find any pronounced sexual dimorphism. In this case, I'm showing you dimorphism of body mass as obtained from 53 adult females and 54 adult males that we captured. The mean body mass is roughly 1200 grams. You have more, more detailed descriptive data at the bottom. Uh, there's no sexual dimorphism in body size and there's no sexual dimorphism in many life history traits. I mean, their, their growth curves are very similar. As I said, the median age of this person is very similar, but we're finding, we're finding some interesting phenotypes in which the differences between the sexes are more pronounced. I'll come back to those later in the talk. So with all that, we were about four, five, six years into the project. That's important, right? Are we gonna call it long-term or not? I'm saying that we were four, five, six years into the project. And what I just described to you was, it all seemed kind of quite straightforward. We had a pair living, toxin, where there's only one adult of each sex, they reproduce with each other, they have infants, they have a little dimorphism, those infants grow and disperse, and they probably become resident uh, breeders in some other groups. So this diagram, your typical diagram of a pair living taxon in a textbook of showing one male and one female, four groups, would make you believe that the mean and variance in reproductive success of males and females, you would predict that they are gonna be similar and relatively low for both sexes. And that was really the way we were thinking up until 2004 or five. In 2002, we published the first study describing dispersal patterns in the species. And we dismissed, I remember a reviewer asking me, is there any possibility that there are animals who are outside those groups, who are floating. And we dismissed that possibility in writing in that 2002 paper. But what happened then is that our, I mean, we, the evidence forced us to change our view of the social system of wild monkeys. And, and the reason that made us believe that something else was happening besides the behavioral ecology of paired adults was that this was a time we were capturing lots of individuals. I had just started doing a postdoc with the San Diego Zoo. And so we're capturing the animals and following the strong recommendations of the vets, we were told not to process the animals in the forest, but take them back to camp and keep them, keep them there as long as we deemed it necessary to preserve their their health, their well-being. So sometimes we would keep the animals all night in camp. Sometimes we would keep them for 10 hours, 16 hours, whatever we thought was safe before returning the animal to the group. But what happened is a couple of times 
uh, when we went back to return the animal to the group, we realized that there was already a new individual in the group. So we were returning now an animal that was physically well, but we had completely messed up his social, his social context. These animals were not able to go back into the group. So when that happened, it was so traumatic, so troubling, that we started connecting the dots and realizing that so many times we couldn't make sense of fights between groups and one animal. So we know a group has five animals and suddenly we see a lot of turmoil in the canopy and there are six. It was never nine or 10, these were not two groups. Or you would be walking around the forest and coming across a very quiet animal, quiet at the time when the groups were active. So all these led us to start thinking that maybe there was something else outside pair living owl monkeys, floaters. Now, a, a, a couple of words on floaters, which is not a word that we use much in primatology. And my impression is that we don't use much when we discuss other mammals either. But it is quite common to be discussed in the literature on birds. And so, and it's really research on owls, not owl monkeys, that gave us a lot of ideas, both empirical ideas to look for certain types of data, as well as theoretical uh, guidelines on how to think about floors. I want to acknowledge that. I'm just acknowledging some colleagues who have long looked and, and thought and written about floors in birds. In this slide, that brings to the table all kinds of factors that we may examine and that people have examined when they have tried to understand the floating, the floating of individuals in bird populations. We're going to try to do some of that. We're going to see for which of these many factors we have gathered data that speaks of the nature of floaters in owl monkeys. So we know now, or the, the hypothesis here is that the variance and the mean of reproductive success in our monkeys will probably depend on what floaters are doing. What are floaters doing? To explore what floaters are doing, I have organized the next many slides presenting data around individual-based questions, questions that we ask from individuals that we know well. Don't forget, I made the point of very little sexual dimorphism. We cannot tell a male and a female owl monkey, unless the female is lactating and you can get very close and you notice the swollen breasts. Sometimes you're lucky and you can tell the testes, but in general, it's very, very difficult to sex them. So when you have animals that are tagged, animals that are marked, then you can really follow them, know their sexes and know their age. When do they become floaters? In this graph, I'm showing you the distribution of dispersal events across the year. In green, dispersal events that occurred during the birth season, not necessarily following the birth of an infant. There is coincidence between the birth season in general, which usually happens October, November, but we do have dispersal events happening in September. And these personal events that are less frequent outside the birth season, the times of the year when the animals are mating and are getting pregnant. These data come from roughly 140 dispersal events that Maggie Corley examined for her doctoral dissertation. Why do they become floaters instead of forming new groups and pairs? There are two hypotheses in the literature. One possibility is that there's just no habitat where they can settle down. The limitation is a room of your own. The second hypothesis is that the limitation in partner availability. I wanna share with you some data that speaks a little bit to both hypotheses. This is an image of the main area of study, roughly 100 hectares of gallery forest in the White Collect Ranch. And this is the area, remember how I said that most of the behavioral data come from about eight or 10 groups? This is where eight or 10 groups range. So we have a grid system. We really keep an eye, a very close eye on these groups. When you go to this area of about hundred hectares, and we have done that for monitoring the groups and for collecting data on their home ranges, 
you find that there are no empty spaces. Here I'm showing you the ranges of about, of about 18 groups. And in each of those ranges, you only find one pair of reproducing adults. The habitat in the gallery forest is saturated. There's only one tiny gap there, but that's a pond. So in case you're wondering what's happening there. Outside these ranges, you're gonna keep finding owl monkeys and, and their home ranges as long as you keep walking. How about available partners? A Mach and Hook led an analysis to estimate the number of floaters that at any one time you're likely to find in those 100 hectares. And the estimate based on our knowledge of the ranges of a large number of floaters, we were able to estimate the ranges of about 24 floaters. So combining the range over which the floaters range and the overlap between those ranges and the ranges of, of the pairs, we concluded that you have between two and five floaters at any one time every 10 groups, which translates to about 10, 20% of adults. If you can close the population, if we take a snapshot, you're gonna have roughly between 10 and 20% of adults who are not in a stable peer living relationship, but are floating around. So with what we have, and of course, there's more that we should get, it seems that habitat saturation is a better explanation for why they're not settling in their own territory that access to partners. In fact, sometimes we do find pairs of floaters, but they don't last. We find them, we see them for a day, for, for a couple of days, for many hours within the range of another group, and then we stop seeing them. We have never seen the formation of a new group de novo. What influences the duration of floating? One possibility is that floating is frequency dependent. Unfortunately, we don't have data for that because it requires to have much more precise count on the number of floaters that exist than we actually do. The other possibility is that floating duration is related to individual quality. Well, we don't really have very strong data speaking to those because it's hard to assess the quality of floaters. What we do have is the actual data, how long they float. On the left, I'm just showing the median, the median number of months that males and females were floaters as, as measured by us. But on the right, I think that the, the, the right graph is the most interesting one showing you how much individuals vary and there's variation for both sexes. Of course, keep in mind that most likely these are underestimates because very, very frequently the data are your left or right sensor. Okay, now you're a floater and presumably you're just trying to find a reproducing opportunity. Of course, you could just try to sneak in copulations with resident breeders or you may try to become a resident yourself. So two strategies that we read about in the literature is that some, sometimes floaters will prospect by that meaning that they move around, they roam, they try to identify where there may be an opening. The other possibility is that they just sit and wait near a group waiting for an opportunity. We have lots of evidence from 58 dispersing animals, from 58 floaters that they do a lot of prospecting. The animals move over wide ranges. Sometimes the prospecting starts before they have made the final move of leaving the natal group. They may go do forays for a couple of hours, for half a day, and come back to the natal group. So we think that there's definitely solid data, speaking of prospecting, and those are probably the many, many times when we see fights. So remember, I was telling you how for many years, we didn't understand what was going on. We have a group of five, and now that group is kind of interacting with a single animal. Well, not all the time. I mean, those, those sometimes are very brief, and with the impression that the animals are prospecting and are kind of keeping an eye or checking into groups. I want to comment a little bit about what is the perspective from the resident breeders' side. One possibility is that the resident breeders think of the neighbor, neighboring groups as the threat. 
to, to the pair, to the territory, to the resources, to the mate. Uh, but it is also possible that they think of the next groups, the neighboring groups as dear enemies with whom they have settled their differences. The boundaries are clear and there's no competition for resources because both groups have the resources they need. Another possibility that it's really the floaters that pose a threat to the pair, to the group, to the mate. Regarding hypothesis one, the natural history data, we've been talking so much about natural history, so difficult to produce quantitative summaries of this. But every single time that we see groups interacting, if they interact aggressively, it doesn't include actual fights. Somebody was asking me whether you can, whether, when I think of a fight, it is true. I tend to think of it as including physical contact, the animals biting each other, grabbing each other. We do see a lot of excitement and running and chasing. And in the process of doing that, animals may fall to the ground when groups interact. But we see a lot, also a lot of rituals. The animals are vocalizing a lot, are displaying. Much more of the responses that we associate with having kind of a dear enemy relationship with neighboring groups. Floaters is a different story. We just did, for the first time after so many years, we managed to conduct a successful field playback experiment that really was based on the work, early work and ongoing work of two uh, PhD students. We, for, 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 many year, for many years, we have tried, we wanted to see if we could manipulate the presence of individuals to trigger responses for groups to understand what are they responding to. This is something that has been tried many, many times with all kinds of pair living primates, but we have not been successful in doing it in a way that gives us solid high quality data. We wanted to see if we could provoke responses that would be speaking to either the animals defending a resource, by that I mean food or a sleeping site or a part of a territory or animals responding to defending their mate. This was a playback experiment that we did over the course of two years. Alba Garcia de la Chica, uh, this is part of her doctoral dissertation that she's submitting these days. But the next slide is gonna describe what we did. And, and so much of this work was possible because Andrea Spence Eisenberg during her doctoral dissertation made huge progress in describing sexual dimorphism in the chemical signal of olfactory scent marks produced by the owl monkeys, and also in describing sex differences in olfactory behaviors. So really both of their work was instrumental in making this study possible. This is briefly the experimental design. We tested six groups. Uh, this is, we're very proud of it. It's not easy to have six groups of owl monkeys that you can recognize. Uh, males and females and ages. And so each group was presented with six different trials in two locations of their territory, the center over the border. We presented them with three acoustic stimuli. A control, which was a good pecker call. And then we presented them with a graph hood, which is a call that only males produce, usually males who are ranging alone and a tonal hood, which is a call that only females produce. This was another step. This was another piece of progress. The ALBA showed through acoustic analysis that there's also sexual dimorphism in the vocal communication of owl monkeys. So our more recent understanding of sexual dimorphism in vocal communication, in olfactory communication allowed us to bring it all together and do these playback experiments where we collected data on how the male and the female in the pair responded to the calls. Specifically, what I want to show you is how they responded with regards to marking their partner, which we know now is something that the animals do when they are very excited, when they're presented with some kind of social stimulus. They jump over each other, they rub each other. So let's look at some of the data we produced. The graph is showing you the number of times that individuals send mark their partner. And I'm showing those data on the left half of the graph for males 
on the, on the right half for females. In green, responses to the playbacks being done from the border of the territory, in purple from the central. I mean, the, the message is quite clear. Both males and females responded more or less similarly, and there isn't anything very clear. In, there's, there's no strong signal that the responses were different when presented from the border or the central part of the territory. We get a different picture where we look at how, again, how frequently males and females send mark their partners in response to different types of calls. Once again, we're looking at the responses on the left half of the graph, the responses of males on the left half of the graph, and the responses of the females on the right half of the graph. You can see that both sexes respond more to calls given by males, graph hoods. There's more response to males than females, but there is response to females, but in those cases, it is females that respond to females. So for the first time, we're detecting sex differences in responses and responses that seem to be related to the sex of the animal producing the call, not necessarily to the location from where the call is given. I want to move on now to, before, after I take a sip of it. Try to share with you some ideas, a little bit of data, on what are some possible population level implications of the existence of these 10, 20% of adults floating around home ranges defended by pairs. We think that there are consequences, I, I, I can show you data, supporting the idea that there are consequences in terms of mortality and reproductive access. And hoping just to generate some, some discussion later on, we can kind of look at these uh, outcomes of mortality and reproductive success within two hypotheses. We may imagine that maybe floating is a suboptimal state, a transient state where all floaters are really trying to become residents. We can think of floaters as competing with residents. I mean, these are just two different ways in which we can look try to explain what we see. They are non mutually exclusive, of course. Are floaters in some way a suboptimal state? The data on body mass, and, and this is one of those slides where you can definitely lie with statistics and I could really make of this slide anything I wanted and you couldn't tell. Uh, this is not cross-sectional, this is not longitudinal, this is a mixed bag of body mass data that you put together when you look at body mass data gathered from all the animals we capture. I will say that something positive of this slide is that it is age controlled. So when we look at animals of the similar ages across different social status, what do we find? Now let me walk you slowly through the graph. So we have on the X axis, six categories of animals that we're considering. You have floater, male and female. You have males and females before they disperse. And then you have young adult males and females, animals who are now resident breeders. The white boxes, those are females. The gray boxes, those are males. So if we look first at the first and fourth, so if we look at this and this, we're looking at floating males and females. And you can see that the medians, I mean, there's a tendency to be a little bit lower mass than if we look at predispersed and definitely lower mass than once they become breeders. These are now longitudinal data. It's only a few, I mean, it's, it's rare that we have the same animal captured so frequently that we can assess his or her weight as a predispersed individual floating and resident. But this is some kind of indirect evidence, maybe speaking of a different kind of, of health status of, of vigor of floaters and resident breeders. With regards to where floaters are competing with resident adults, the evidence is so much stronger and I think much more compelling. We published this in 2013. We summarized data following 27 female replacements and 23 male replacements. Please, this is an important take home message. Everything I've said applies to both males and females. Males are getting replaced. Females are gonna be challenged as well. And the numbers were similar. Because of this, because of males and females 
being challenged by floaters and services getting replaced, the median duration of pairs was about nine years for 26 pairs for which we had data out of 18 groups during the first decade when we had solid data. Yes, we need to look at this data again for the second decade, but we haven't done that yet. What's interesting is that the number of infants that individuals who manage to stay with the same partner produce is about 20% more than the number of infants produced by individuals who are forced to change partners. So that's what the graph is showing you. The graph is showing you on the left, the median number of infants produced per decade of tenure for individuals who only had one partner during their lives. The box on the right is showing you the median number of infants produced per decade for individuals who have more than one partner. It drops from 7.9 infants to 6.3 infants. Regardless of whether it's statistically significant or not, we'll, talk, we'll get to that soon. I think that is a substantial decrease in reproductive success if you lose 25% of the offspring you may sire. This is a more recent analysis, again, led by Garcia de la Chica Alba as part of her dissertation. We're looking at the relationship between replacement of parents and infant survival. We looked at 149 infants born between 1999 and 2018. And we asked the following question, how does survival of infants change if what gets replaced in the group is their biological father, biological mother, or neither or both. Look, focusing on where that change occurred during the first year of life of the infant. So what happens? What is the age of disappearance, death or dispersal of infants when, one, when there was a change in their appearance during the first year of life? So when both biological parents, this is the right far corner box, with both biological parents stay in the group or the biological father stays in the group, there are no differences. What, what, what really jumps in your face is that it is when you get a new male. It is when you get a new male. It's when the father of the infant gets replaced that survival goes down. Now, we have not we have never seen aggression from the incoming male. We have never seen directed aggression of, of the infant. We have never seen infanticide in the way we think about it when we read the word. Our understanding of the situation is that the removal of the care given father may for some reason affect the survival of the infants. So this is consequence of floaters. This is consequence of replacing, affecting infant mortality and well-being. The last, these are not as much data or, or their data, but more kind of the natural history data that all of us uh, were having talking so important to what we do. With all this, I mean, can, can we try to consider whether what I have described for this subset of individuals in the population, can we think of them as being the consequence of a subset of individuals being of inferior gene quality? We have no data. I mean, we are in the middle of a three-year NSF grant that is going to allow us to do all kinds of genetic testing, but uh, that is something that will come hopefully in the future. We cannot tell if the floaters, if, if, if the genetic pool of the floater is in some ways different from the genetic pool of those who eventually become resident breeders. Is it possible that this is an alternative reproductive tactic? Uh, we have no data suggesting that. I mean, we have no evidence of any floater being in that state permanently. The longest floating period we have recorded has been 15 months. We have no evidence of reproduction by floaters. That includes both behavioral data. We've never seen a floater mounting or copulating with a resident breeder, nor we have genetic data speaking of extra pair copulation. In the only data set that we examined for relatedness, it was a set of 35 infant purity father diets. All infants 
where all, all infants were attributed to their putative father as being the biological father. So we have no genetic data, we have no behavioral data suggesting that the floaters are reproducing. Uh, now, what's gonna happen? That was only 35 diets. We'll have to see as we complete the analysis that are going on with this new grant, if that changes. So all evidence, all evidence really points towards floating being a live stage more than something that happens because a subset of individuals are of inferior quality or as part of an alternative reproductive strategy, uh, which is what I just said. All individuals disperse, so all evidence points to be in a live stage. They, they all disperse upon reaching sexual maturity and they either become residents or they die. They seem to have lower body condition than territory holders, but the, but the difference apparently disappears when they become residents. The lifetime reproductive success of floaters who survive the floating stage is the same as the one for residents. That's ongoing work. We're going to look at that. And all floaters that we have followed attempt to become territory holders. So to wrap up what we have learned from, from the studies we've done and the evidence that I've shared with you, our monkey floaters constitute 10, 20% of adults in the population. I think that's a substantial number of adults that require that we study them, that will require we understand what they do, what role they play in the population. Being a floater seems to be a life stage, not an inferior genes condition or an ART. All monkey floaters influence intrasexual competition, no doubts. Mortality of infants, no doubts. Mortality of adults, I mean, some of the fights between the residents and the floater end up with the death of the adult, of the same sex adult that's getting replaced, but also now going to the subadults. Sometimes in the process of those fights, everyone gets wounded. And we have followed three, four year old subadults who died following one of these fights. And the fourth wrapping up comment I wanna make, which is gonna take me to the very, very last uh, data is that looking, it was looking outside our taxonomic bubble that opened our eyes to floaters in our monkeys. That has been a consistent message. That's the reason we're doing the seminar series. We need to look, we need to take a comparative perspective. We need to look outside our system. It paid out for us in terms of ideas, in terms of generating new hypotheses, in terms of testing hypotheses that exist in the literature of other taxa. We have also opened up our eyes to other pair living taxa in primates. And I want to spend a couple minutes talking about what are we learning about floaters in these other taxa that we've been studying together with my colleague and friend, Tony Di Fiore. It was back in 2002, already 18 years. Tony and I were students at UC Davis. And he, had, and he had been studying woolly monkeys in the Amazon of Ecuador. And so we joined efforts and we started the Associate Ecology of Monogamous Primates Project to add to the owl monkeys of Argentina, the owl monkeys of Tipotini, the Tidis and the Sakis. We've made lots of progress. Uh, you can read about all the research we've done with all four taxa in these two reviews. One's, one that we published with Dr. Marin Hook, who joined our project about 10 years ago in a recent volume published by Alex Ophir and Nancy Solomon. And a second paper we just published together with Dr. Sally Van Bell, who also joined the project about 10 years ago in the yearbook of physical anthropology. What's the evidence for floaters in this taxa? Well, for the Sakis, it's all, I mean, we, we do not have conclusive evidence, but uh, there was a time, Tony witnessed this, when we had an adult male replaced. An adult male died in the group that we best know. It was very clear that very soon, very fast, Tony was seeing several males moving around. And in a matter of, if I remember well, in a matter of hours or days, there was already a new male in the group. That's for the Sakis. For the Tidis, we don't even have that. I mean, we have been studying about five groups of Tidis, but uh, this is the fun of preparing for the talk. I was communicating with our colleague, Eckhart Heyman, literally today in the morning, gathering gathering details about floaters in other places. Uh, and Eckhart uh, has been studying tiddy monkeys in Peru. 
and this is what he said. Mathematically, I would say that there must be floaters or alternatively mortality of some adults, young adults must be high. So they don't see them, but the rapid pairing of a dispersing male and the rapid replacement of a dead adult female suggest that the floaters have to be there. There are alternative explanations. Maybe in both cases, the solo singing must be obvious to everybody in the range of audibility and could trigger the migration of youngster waiting for a vacancy. So this is very anecdotal. This is natural history. This is exactly what we're talking about. It takes a long time, takes many years, but we cannot come up with alternative hypotheses that would rule out that there have to be animals out there that we're just not detecting. To conclude, maybe you noticed that I have really, really mentioned very, very little statistics. It is easy to lie with statistics and, and, and uh, we're always without knowing, they're not on purpose, but sometimes we tend to dress up too much our findings. And I have tried to stay away from the, that. Uh, because really what I wanna spend the last couple minutes, and I hope that we'll be interested to discuss some more during the questions and answers is what I perceive in our disciplines, by that I mean behavioral ecology, animal behavior, pragmatology, to get a better balance between formal statistical inference and scientific inference. I strongly recommend this paper by Harvard and colleagues in, in the American statistician from last year. They work on that. They work on the idea that there's more than statistics. Now, having said that it is easy to lie with statistics, I want to offer it to you, the complete quote. Maybe you know it. The complete quote really says that, yes, it may be easy to lie with them, but it's also very hard to tell the truth without them. So we do know, we do need statistics, but I think we need them in the context, in a more comprehensive context of complete scientific inference. And this is what has been in the media. All of you have seen it, starting in 2016, with the American Statistical Association statement on p-values calling attention to our need to bring to the forefront of our inferential process all aspects that have nothing to do with mathematical inference. And they have all to do with understanding our biological system, with knowing our species, knowing our individuals, knowing our methods and the quality of data we have collected. In 2019, that was followed by a letter to nature by, by Valentin Ambrain and some colleagues calling to retire statistical significance, which is something that I have done from my own talking, teaching, and writing. And on that same year, Ron Wasserstein, Alan Schrim, and Nicole Lazar, and I'm very thankful to, to them because they are joining us today for further discussion, edited, led a volume with 43 articles in the American Statistician by authors covering all kinds of disciplines, calling us to stop, stop using statistical significance to judge how robust, how conclusive, how powerful our research and our science is. And instead, they're suggesting that we embrace uncertainty. I love this photograph. This is a bunch of statisticians, Valentin was telling me. Embrace uncertainty. Statistics is the science of estimating uncertainty. But again and again, we're using it to claim deterministic results. That's not what statistics does best. It helps us quantify uncertainty. So I think that's the last one. I ask you to remember Atom, which is what Ron and his colleagues suggest in the editorial opening article to the volume. And by that we mean accept uncertainty and quantify it and discuss it and present it. Be thoughtful, be open, be modest. I hope we can get a lot of that in the next hour when we talk about our own research. Last one, I wanna let you know that next week, Aaron Sandel is gonna be the speaker. And I'm delighted to know that you'll get more of this. Aaron has been thinking, writing and publishing a lot about the importance of paying attention to variation in data, in data quality. And that's going to be the central topic of his work. You can see from the quote that he has chosen that he's very much online with some of the ideas that made us organize the, the seminar in the first place. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Eduardo, for a fascinating talk. I think there will be plenty of questions. It would be enough, probably, you had two big topics, your field work and the statistics. We could discuss this um, for, for hours. I alone would have enough questions to fill at least one hour about your um, work. Now, how does question and answers go? You should use the chat function and write down um, to best this to everyone so you, everyone sees where he is, a question mark. And when I see the question mark in your name, then I will call up on you and say, please um, ask your question. What also would be nice when I call your name, if you repeat your name and say where you're coming from. So everybody in the audience kind of knows um, who we, we are, are dealing, dealing with. Then um, I also um, recommend that not only the old experienced researchers, but also the students, please participate um, to the discussion and to um, encourage this a little bit. I have um, a prize for the first student today to ask a question that will be a voucher for three nights free accommodation at the research station in South Africa, the striped mouse project, including going out to the field, observing the mice. Unfortunately, we can't cover the cost of transport for you to get there to South Africa. But if you ask a question here and you get there, you're welcome to stay for free at the station um, for, for some nights. So like, like I said, um, you can just write a question mark in the chat if you um, have a, a question. And, um, but I'm happy to start, Eduardo. If I understood you right, if a group member gets replaced. It's always by a floater. It's never by an individual from a neighboring group. That is correct. We have never seen, we, we don't see any time that somebody asks me that question, it makes me think of, of a 1994 paper that Ryan Palombit, who studied Gibbons and Siemens wrote about dynamics of pair bonds. And I think that was one of the earliest uh, descriptions of the dynamics of pairs. And he would be talking like people who study birds do about divorce or deserting. We do not see may, we don't see breeders deserting their partners to either go replace someone else or take on an empty slot. So in the, in the paper that we published with Maren, the, the till death do us part, we kind of hypothesize, hypothesize that the evidence speaks only for extrinsic factors triggering the disruption of the bond or the disruption of the pair. I don't want to throw the word bond too early into our talking. So there are, we, we, we haven't identified intrinsic sources that make the pair break. So it's always an animal that comes. All the events that we've seen it was always animals who were alone. We've never seen a resident take over another resident. But I mean, sometimes individuals must die and replace it only forever. So why, why do you think they float? Why don't they have a sit and wait tactic? Okay, I wait here until the breeding position in one of the three neighboring groups becomes vacant. Do you think, is there a spatial structure of kinship to avoid inbreeding. It doesn't make sense to immigrate to the neighbors. You have to go further. Yeah, I, want, I want to take your, your question slowly, the various components. So why don't they sit and they why don't they sit and wait? Well, the first the easy part to answer is that we know they don't. Uh, one possibility is that a, a sit and wait strategy would require that they're very, very quiet and they because they get a lot of aggression and chases. And uh, when we look at how the floaters move with regard to the groups, we do find that they try to avoid them spatially. And that's also an impression we had from the very early days. So it may be that moving changes, which is the group that suddenly realize that you pose a threat. So they move around. Now, uh, the genetic question that you ask, we cannot yet answer. We have not really looked at that. The data we have on dispersal distance is quite inconclusive. Uh, we have both males and females dispersing sometimes next door. So we do, this is linked to your first question. Sometimes a subadult becomes the resident breeder of the next door group. That we have seen several times. 
So, but we have also seen males and females dispersing quite far apart. So we have no clear pattern of where males or females are dispersing closer or further than the other sex. Did I help me out? Did I address or am I forgetting yes. some part of your comment? No, that's good. Thank you. So then the first question, and I think it's from a student who wants to come really to South Africa, is from Cheyenne Smith. Hi, uh, um, for everyone, I'm Cheyenne Smith. I'm first year at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in a master's program. Um, I just wondered, because you were talking about how the males in this species show high paternal care, and then you also mentioned um, when a new male comes in, how that affects the offspring. Have you looked to see like what kind of behaviors and I think that's might have been what you were suggesting when you said there was no infanticide. Do the males provide any type of paternal care to the offspring in the group they take over? A couple of times we saw that happening. We have a little paper published in 2008 where we describe the kind of papers that we were discussing last week that would be nice if more journals were welcoming of this, very rich in details relatively poor in, in the extent of data set, right? Because this was one male being replaced. And when that happened, the infant was born in October and the process of replacement of his biological father took several weeks. So when the new male moved in, the infant was about three, four weeks of age. For many weeks, we did not see the new male providing any care, but it was about actually, the replacing of his father created a situation, one of the few situations when we saw siblings care. In this species, like in Tidimakis, we seldom see siblings providing care like we see in marmosets and tamarins. So in this situation, we, we have some data showing that the sibling transported the infant, and then eventually we also have some data showing that the new male transported the infant. What is very, what, what we do not have high quality data is for the specifics, the nuances, the details of what makes a male a good father or not, a, or not such a good father. The truth is that we, we, can, we do not have the power because of the logistics of collecting data from these guys to figure out, well, yeah, but you know, I mean, this no male is not really handling the infant like the, like the real male was doing. So, whether that translates, the infant eventually disappeared, which when an animal disappears younger than a year and a half, I say disappear just to be open and modest about what we know, but we assume it died because we have never seen an animal disperse younger than 22 months. So is there something in the quality of the care provided by a new male that was different? or why is it for the analysis of the 149 infants, which is more extensive, but, but that's an analysis done on where the infants survive or not. And what we lack is detailed, rich behavioral data on the care provided by the males to the 149 infants. Uh, so no, I, I hope that any of, of the team members who may be attending, uh, they can also always contribute trying to enrich my answers, but we, we cannot tell. Never aggression, never aggression. Now remember so many times, this is something that, that I, I've seen in captivity with the teeny monkeys. You don't need aggression for an infant to be affected. I mean, just not paying enough attention can be enough to influence the, the well-being of the infant. If when the mother stops nursing, the new male Something that happens a lot is that male and female in captivity and in the wild, titties and owl monkeys, they're very coordinated. By that I mean they're always within close distance, which really facilitates the infant transferring from mom to dad. It, it would only take the new male not to be very close to the female, that when the female is done nursing, the, the infant may not have somebody willing to take him. And that may just have some cost. Okay, then there's a question by Davina Hill, which I first overlooked. That she wrote the question, not the question mark. But Davina, can you do you want to ask your question? Hi, um, Davina Hill, University of Glasgow. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. So, if I remember correctly, you said that about ten to twenty percent of the population of floaters 
I was wondering what proportion of individuals become floaters at any point in their lives and whether that proportion differs between the sexes. So uh, the, the, your question calls for a much needed clarification of at least how we are thinking about the use of the word floater as opposed to this person, individual, dispersal, roamer, transient, or any choice of words that we will, may want to have. Every single individual born into a group has left the group. We have had never, never an animal reproduce in the group where it was born. They disperse, they die, right? But never they stay, they never. So in that sense, the way we think of it is that everyone becomes a floor. Now, that's why we need to start talking about how is this different from other situations where animals disperse, in all kinds of tax animals disperse. And, and that applies to both males and females. Both males and females disperse, which is something that, that we, we've always been expecting. And, and it was discussed, I'm thinking of Greenwood 1980, where of course, if you have pair living taxa, you predict that both sexes will disperse because the alternative is that you reproduce with your mom or dad. So everyone disperses. Now, what is a floater? We have, we we're talking about this the other day, anticipating this, this very exciting uh, session of questions and answers. Uh, we have had animals on which we couldn't have collected any data as floaters because I'm thinking of a female who left this group and became the resident breeder on the next group within from one day to the next. So that female as a subject wouldn't have given us any data on ranging alone, wouldn't have given us any data on fighting to enter a group. So did she float? Well, it depends on how we define it because technically she moved from one group to the other, but I don't know, maybe she did float. She was doing prospecting for months and she eventually settled there. So uh, they, 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 what we've what been talking about with, with lots of colleagues as I, as I was preparing for, for the presentation, what we think, so, so what we, what we want to express further is how come we're not seeing this phenomenon where a substantial number of adults are not in resting positions. They are not in groups. So, so that, that's what I'm calling floater. Uh, now, of course, one assumes that I, I didn't, I don't want to go follow, I don't want to fall into teleonomic definitions of, of they are dispersing for breeding. Well, evolutionarily speaking, that's the, the assumption that, that there is a purpose to the behavior that needs to result in the animal reproducing. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't be adaptive for the animal to disperse. But if we don't get into the teleonomic way of thinking about this person, that this person to reproduce, the description of the phenomenon is that you have substantial number of animals moving sometimes over a big area for a substantial time. And in doing so, and this is the important part from a theoretical perspective, is that we need to consider them because going to the last part of your question, we, everything suggests that there's a lot of mortality at this stage. Is mortality different between males and females? What are the numbers? How does the presence of these floaters change the operational sex ratio? Because we cannot keep thinking that there's one male to one female if, for example, we were to find out that there are many more female floaters than male floaters, that should change completely how we think about the operational sex ratio or the adult sex ratio for the species. The, the, the intrasexual competition for males and females would be different. You may remember I showed you a slide saying that there's room for, for figuring out where this tendency for males to disperse younger. I mean, they, they may we had some very young males dispersing, we have some very old females dispersing. I mean, is that in some way reflecting different growth trajectories, dispersal trajectories and mortality trajectories? Uh, we, we do know of other animals, of course. I mean, I was just talking to Lauren and Kirsten and they're transient devils, they are their roamer uh, striped mice. Now, how are they impacting they're reproducing units. I mean, are they fighting with them? What we see here is that this is quite frequent. 
this is very intense, this is dramatic competition between these guys and resident breeders. Something that hasn't come up yet is that, ex except for a couple of animals who managed to have a secondary dispersal, every single animal who has been kicked out dies, for what we know. We follow them because usually you have a radio collar and eventually we stop seeing them. Uh, and I think we have two animals, I wanna say two males, so three and one more, whom we saw moving into a new reproducing group. Does that, did, did I address your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so the next question is from Filippo Aurelli. Okay, thank you. Uh, Filippo Aurelli from Universidad Veracruzana in Mexico. And uh, I, not a student, but I would not mind if Karsten uh, allows me to go and visit. I have a question for uh, Eduardo, and then if I can, but the, otherwise I follow up later, one for the statistician that Eduardo invite for this talk. Um, the, my question for Eduardo is really following up of what uh, Cheyenne and, and Davina mentioned, and is about uh, putting maybe the, the idea of the floaters in a kind of comparative perspective that is part of uh, the idea of the of the se uh, seminar series to try. And you mentioned other species like gibbons, calatrids, then the other two species that you study in, uh, in Ecuador, they are variation on the same kind of theme. And I wonder if uh, uh, the strategy of sit and wait that you uh, think it is not working because you interpret it that uh, is the floater sitting wait when it's already a floater could actually be working on this last uh, explanation you mentioned uh, uh, answering the question of Davina when they actually sit and wait in their own group. Right. And so it's a more like calitrates type of style, you know, and now the calitrates, they are doing that and they are also helping. Uh, but those guys clearly don't help uh, much uh, the, the parents. And so I was thinking about if you could say something uh, more about uh, um, if we take in a broader perspective, maybe this uh, variation in the length of the floating stage could be having a different strategy. Um, and not only between the two sexes, but also depending on the availability uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in new places for forming this, uh, these groups. I agree, I like it. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's a, the, the, the prospecting that I described could well be the sit and wait. So, so I always, when I want to talk to the students, I always really like, because I, I think of this stage of floating, it always makes me think of, on, on of our young adults and the students in the college and the university, I always tell them, well, I mean, you could do, you could be doing sit and wait, still living with mom and dad, going on trips and knowing that you have the safe haven to go back. And we do see a lot of prospecting. So you're right. I mean, one could be thinking of that as, a, as the sit and wait, and waiting for water, waiting for the right time, waiting for the right season, food, temperature. You, you have reached either some extent of sexual maturation or weight, whatever it is that triggers that, that drive to actually now leave and not come back. Uh, the, the range both spatially and temporally, so how far the range and how long the range, uh, it is very rich in details, but it is also very, very messy as a data set because uh, when you have radio colored animals, that's a different story. But even then, it's like the numbers. That's why I was, as, as I was, since you're interested in them having some conversations about uh, the science we do, uh, that's why I was saying that so much of what we do, we're trying to apply criteria for inference that are not developed for the kind of discipline we have. So, so when, when we have these data sets that are collected over the course of 20 years by 100 researchers and on all kinds of conditions that we're not disclosing, and that's what I think, I'm trying to be open and say, and I could tell you, I could show you the, the mean of how long they ranged. And you go home thinking that males and females on average range the same time, flow at the same time, but when you start looking at the data and we all know it's a mess and how do you make, if you have lots of data, then you hope to find some, some signal over the noise. But when we don't have those data sets that you may have if you study some other systems, it gets complicated. I like the idea of sit and wait. That's something you said, all for thinking about outside the system. I have made a note 
Uh, I think that you, your, your conversation with Lauren Diare was beautiful. You have such a wonderful example of what we wanted to create with the seminar series. You say, listen, but isn't that a fusion fusion? And, and now we're, we're thinking of Degus and chimps or, or spider monkeys uh, in, kind of all together. Uh, we are, we're doing a following up in, uh, after this talk. Great. That, 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 only that's after, so that, that's uh, the Karsten decided. So, uh, sorry, mm, uh, Lauren. So we are doing that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, did I? So I, I like the idea of sit and wait. Now, uh, are these different strategies? Are, are, are they going to be? Of course, one assumes they are context dependent. And by context, I mean anything from food availability to temperature. Uh, this, this area gets very, very cold in the winter for, for, for monkey standards, right? You can get frost, you can get temperatures below zero. So we assume that ranging on your own at night, it must be kind of a different thermal regulatory challenge than if you do that in July, than if you do it in August, September or October. So uh, yes, I like that. I like your idea of sit and wait, Filippo. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. I, okay. I, 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 Carsten, I wait for the, my other questions, okay? Or do you want me to give it? Because I think there are many people. Maybe just write another question mark and then- Yeah, we, perfect. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. Just a quick note to the people on YouTube. Your questions will also be asked, but they're not in line yet. So hang on there. But now it's time for Sulema Tang Martinez, please. Yes, hi, um, Eduardo. I have two questions that are a little bit related. One is I'm still a little unclear on how frequently challenges by floaters are successful. And then related to that, I was really intrigued by the fact that males, when you, when you did the playback experiment, that males mark their mates more or increase their marking when they hear male sounds and females increase their marking of their mates after they hear female sounds, which I assume that's a response like to a simulated response to floaters calling. And I wonder if there's any evidence that marking your mate in a situation where you might be challenged has any effect on the success of the challenges. So is that, to, is that clear? Yes, I think it is. Okay. The, the questions are clear. The answers might not be. The, so, so to the first question of a, we would like so that you would like to know more about the rate of success. So do we. A, but again, talking about a, being very, very open with the limitations, we have to be more open and discuss more of the limitations of our data sets and research. They're so hard to, I mean, you, you cannot collect negative data. So we only know this. So we, ha we have such a biased data set towards challenges that work out and the floater moves in. Uh, the only way to collect failures by floaters is of course, you can stay with the group and you do or follow the floaters. But we, we haven't figured out a way of really producing a quantitative estimate of success and failure that satisfies us. Uh, we, there are lots and lots of interactions, not to mention that I'm sure that not all challenges are the same. I mean, sometimes we're pretty much more likely to notice challenges that go all the way, right? Because you're walking the forest and you hear, you hear noises, you hear branches and you go check it out. Now, if, if it doesn't escalate to a, full, to a full fight, we may miss it. Sometimes the processes may take many days. One, one way in which the floaters operate, and, and this paper in 2008, that's why we were able to so, so richly describe it, is because you're following a group and you realize that there's a monkey nearby. And you, you can see, uh, you can hear this. And, and it so happened that this monkey had a color, so we knew him. And so for, for several days, this floater hung around and there were kind of little skirmishes and interactions and, and, and then a, a fight that it's a little bit more intense. So we don't even know if the whole group, sometimes we get the impression that the whole group fights the, re, the, the, the floater off. Other times the expectation could be that no, it should just be the same sex resident breeder. But even that sometimes gets very confusing when you're trying to, to collect data in the forest. So the short answer is, I wish we had 
some solid data on the rate of success and failure of replacing breeders, we don't. And the second part of your question was, uh, I lost my train of thought, you said, re remind me what uh, was the second um, Well, it sounds like you probably won't, wouldn't have enough data to say this either, but whether the scent marking of the mates- Oh, right, right. Have, so what's the function? What's what's the function? So so we know that the animals sometimes walk over each other and they rub their surfaces. So what could be the function of this in response to a simulated intruder? Uh, we take it as part of a mate guarding display. We take it as part of communicating a state of arousal or alertness. Uh, it's just I mean is that the function or is that kind of an epiphenomenon of the animal getting very excited and responding to a same sex individual and just joining the, the mate. The fact that the replacement for the data set we examined, the fact that the replacement has a cost for the remaining partner, right, may lead one to hypothesize that neither partner should be excited about the replacement. In many pair living primates, we know from, from studies of captive colonies that you really have a delay for the pairs to start breeding. When you form pairs of breeders in captivity, this applies definitely for the owl monkeys, which I mean, there are 40 years of, of captive records from owl monkeys, but also for the titties. Whenever you form a new pair, it is very, very common, like in so many other pair living taxa, birds and mammals, that they skip they do not go straight into reproducing. The argument, I mean, the hypothesis has been that because this is gonna be some kind of long-term commitment to each other, you need to establish, you need to kind of check each other and establish some kind of relationship. That happens in the field. It's only been a few times that a new pair had an infant the first year. So there is a cost to the remaining partner as well. So that may make it, I mean, it seems feasible that both members of the pair may resist the replacement of one of them. Uh, so that, that's a little bit an attempt of, of I mean, the scent marking, we see a lot with the teens as well. Uh, when, the four, when a new pair forms, we also see a lot of this jumping over and grabbing each other, even when it is not mating season. So we really think it has to do with pair formation and pair consolidation. Okay, don't get scared. I stopped sharing the screen so we can see each other better. But Eduardo, if there is a question coming where you have to go back to a slide, then you can just um, share the screen again, of course. Uh, so the next question is by Heimann. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Eckhard Heimann, senior researcher at the German Primate Center and director of a field research site in Peruvian Amazon. Sorry, you can't see me. My camera is broken. so. Uh, first of all, thank you, Eduardo, for this great talk. Um, you mentioned that you sometimes see pairs of floaters. And if you see pairs of floaters, are they, they same sex or are they male-female pairs? And do you have an idea whether they come from the same natal group? I mean, if this were the case, it would be somehow remindful of this tandem dispersal that Paul Garber reported for, for tamarinds. So let me, because we have our young colleagues and, and let me just, and also to lighten up a little bit the, the conversation for everyone to take a, a breath while we discuss science. So when we started uh, back in, in, in the 90s and we would have lots of students and we would go out and, and try to find groups and describe the social organization of those groups. So you were supposed to come back and tell us how many animals you found in the group and what else. Are you going to tell us the sex of those groups? I mean, the, those of those individuals? Well, you could have if you went looking for groups with this information you had in your mind that somebody had said from captive colonies that our monkeys are organized in pairs of one male and one female. So you go out and you come back confirm that there was a male and a female because you saw two animals. But the truth is that you saw no testes, you saw no vagina, you have no evidence whatsoever to know that those are a male and a female. And I mentioned that because it's all over the place uh, with 
animals that are very difficult to distinguish. I mean, we, we tend to forget that we want to go study. If the male owl monkey provides care, we go to the field. And so we see an animal transporting the infant and we say, that has to be the male. Oh, and he's, he's doing a lot of care. So complete circularity of reasoning. So the problem with the floaters that we find as pairs is that so many times we haven't captured them yet. And so the only thing I can say is that most of the times, I think we have one couple, one pair of owl monkeys, if I remember well, Alba or Margen help me out, that we know their, their sexes. But so most of the times what we see is we find out, we, we go out and we find two animals that look about the same size, and the size seems to be the size of adults. Those are the data. The rest is speculation. So that's the answer to you, Eckhart. That, that uh, of course, we assume that it's male and female, but huge assumption, I don't know. Uh, but, but it's very rare, which is, would be something else. Why, why is it that we, given that we know we have so many floaters around, why don't we see those more frequently? Uh, that would be actually, for me, possible evidence that it is a male and a female because, so you have floaters of all kinds moving around and every so often a male and a female get together and attempt at staying there. So yes, it, may, it, may, it makes me think I was discussing this with Alexa uh, Duchino and David Wood who are now uh, working with us who, who, and, and who uh, studied capuchins with Susan Perry. He, we're talking about this because it made me think also of the descriptions that Kathy Jack made of brothers, brother capuchin monkeys dispersing together and ranging as pairs. Uh, so, but we never see, but we never see pairs challenging a group. Hi, Eduardo, just you asked, yes. uh, we could elaborate. I know Please. that there's been at least one case where a temporary pair that we saw consisted of a brother and a sister from the same group that we believe had the same two genetic parents. So at least on some occasions, we know that there's a male and a female, but they came from the same group. Oh, I had forgotten that. Like who, yeah, so. who, who were they? Do you remember? and Discoteca. There you go. Wow, I had forgotten that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then um, the next question is by Nancy Solomon. Hi, Eduardo. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I'm beginning to think that primates and rodents have a lot in common in terms of what we have been describing as monogamy. Um, so I think you might have already answered my question which was, do some dispersers directly become part of the breeding pair without floating first? And if I understood correctly, that sounded rare? Yes, it depends on your definition of, I mean, it depends on the temporal scale that we're gonna demand to classify yeah. the animal as having been a floater. Now, I think that what Filippo was mentioning before, I, I'm thinking of this, this female money who really moved in from one group to the other very, very fast. That doesn't mean that she may not have been sitting and waiting, prospecting, because uh, that could have happened, but we didn't pick it up that if she was ranging. So it does happen that sometimes animals appear in a new group relatively fast. And it does happen, somebody asked me before, whenever an animal dies, I mean, it's been at the most a few days that we have had a group with only one reproducing adult. That's also speaks of, of we think there, not only there are lots of floaters, but they know because uh, I'm thinking of one case where the female died and in a matter of hours, boom, there was somebody moving in. And, and when I told you, when we capture the animals, we take them to camp, again, animals are moving in. So how are they, how do they know? Is it because their prospecting tells them is it because they start developing potential relationship with future partners? Is, are they calling? Are they sniffing? But they, it happened so fast. It became, I mean, it really became a matter of concern. We could not afford to capture animals and take them to the forest anymore. Now we, we, we went from the kind of the physical exam to the physical exam express, which is now we have the logistics and everything is done. We just do, we just do the minimum in the forest, 
somebody keeps an eye on the group, making sure that nobody moves in, and you try to get that animal back into the group. Sounds very much like what we saw in the in the woodland voles when I was a postdoc, when we were doing those kind of observations in an apple orchard, and then we did some experimental removals, and um, another individual would show up so quickly to fill that slot. Well, when you remove an animal, it's very, very common that the partner left behind. I wish I had known this when we started. Uh, this is the, the paper we published with Alba describing the calls made by the remaining partner. So it's very, very common, but we never, of course, I didn't have a data collection protocol when we first captured an animal. So these were kind of an ad libitum data set. So it's very common that the animal left behind calls and sometimes even looks at and, and they don't run away. They don't. So that call, yes, it may be a call of contact to its partner, but it's also a call that you're letting know in the forest. And so is that call of the remaining partner, presumably to his or her partner, becoming also a way of letting others know that there's a vacancy. That's really interesting. Thank you. So the next question is by Kingsley Hunt, please. Uh, hi, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Kingsley, I'm at the University of Exeter uh, over in the UK. Um, so first, Edward, I, I thought it was a really great talk. So thank you, and I'm really enjoying the series so far. Um, I guess my question comes from, in your talk, by the sound of it, it sounded like you were inspired the idea of flotos uh, kind of came from studies in ornithology and from other taxas. So looking at these kind of traditional studies in birds. And I'm interested in your perspective as a primatologist, whether you think there might be a taxonomic divide um, between what, maybe what you're doing and what others in behavioral ecology are doing. Um, sometimes we're in different departments of universities or publishing in different journals um, as well. And I guess apart from seminar series like this, if that is a problem, like how do we bridge it or how do we start to bring these kind of ideas together uh, when sometimes it, we can be asking the same questions in different species, but not really listening and talking to each other. Thank you. Yes, I think there is a divide. And I, I was reflecting on this as I prepared for the talk and actually I wrote it down, but I didn't say it. I thought it was funny that, so, so many of us primatologists are housed in departments of anthropology. And again and again, talking among us or talking to our colleagues in other fields of anthropology or teaching, we say, of course you need to study non-human primates. How are you gonna know what makes humans unique if you don't compare? Now, suddenly, when we start talking about primatology at large, we never use the same rationale and say, of course you have to start this something that is not primate. How are you gonna be able to understand what makes primates unique if you don't look outside primates? So for me, because I've been lucky that my very first system was crabs, Casmaniatus granulatus, studying learning and memory. And, and I've always been interested in, and, and my PhD was in animal behavior. So from the go, I just loved it to be at UC Davis and learning about all kinds of animals. So the divide exists. It is important that, that our young colleagues are aware of it. Uh, I discuss it with PhD students because the kind of topics you choose or you publish, it's gonna condition how they look at you when you apply for jobs. Uh, that's important. Remember, I couldn't get a teaching position in, right after I finished my PhD, I wanted to get a teaching position in Sierra College, Sierra College in Sacramento. And technically they couldn't hire me because my PhD, I had been teaching introduction to human evolution, but my PhD was in animal behavior. And just, they could not hire me because I didn't have a degree in anthropology. Even when I had, so, so that exists. I think that we need to uh, slow down. We need to force ourselves and encourage our, the people working with us to read and think outside the system that we work and look for this, these opportunities for dialogue and an exchange of ideas. Uh, seminars are a good, great way of doing it. I have tried for years and I don't know where we are. Maybe the, the students at Yale will surprise me, but I just don't understand how we haven't built connections between the grad students in anthropology and the grad students in ecology and evolution. I mean, our students are doing ecology and evolution. There are, you have some connections with forestry, but this is one that I think so many times 
we feel responsible for situations that our students face. I wanna pass this one on a little bit more to the young. You guys need to take control of your own. In that sense, there's a lot that students can do. Organize activities across departments. The animal behavior group was fantastic. I mean, I met Tony and we took courses together, but he was a student in anthropology. I was a student in animal behavior. So it fostered this interest in, in all, all kinds of taxa. Uh, the divide is not going to help open up the opportunities for jobs. You really have, that's something else. I mean, stop narrowing your interests. I, 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 because you're, by narrowing your interests, you're narrowing the job talks you can give. You're narrowing the, job, the jobs you can apply to. Uh, practical things that we could do. Okay, then there comes a series of questions from Charlotte, first her own question, and then she's also asking the questions that have been written on YouTube in the um, channel at our live video. Yeah, hello, so Charlotte and Olivier, PhD students at the University of Strasbourg in France. Uh, so my question is more um, methodological question is, um, how did you define on the field uh, that two individuals were living in Paris? Is it only with home ranges or there was other factors? How did I decide to conclude yeah. that individuals were living in pairs? Yeah. Uh, I think that's something we can use, which is something actually we have used with, with Tony and Sari and Magan as we consider also the situation with the Sakis and the Tidis. Uh, for me, a, a, a quite powerful, evolutionarily meaningful proxy is who reproduces. So, so how many offspring? So, so it, whether I call them pure living or not, that can easily take us to discuss what makes an animal an adult. But I think there's a lot we can gain from just also keeping an eye on focusing on, okay, who produces infants and how many infants are produced. So if for us, we never see more than one infant produced by one female and by the same female, whom we assume is for the most part, we assume it's reproducing with this male. For some animals, we have genetics suggesting that she is reproducing with this male. So that's what I call pair living. Now, if the question comes from these conversations we've had of how we're going to analyze published data and how we're going to catalog or classify data that are reported one way or the other, and when we decide that this population is pair living, a I think it would be important to include an element of reproduction, not just behavior, because what really matters is who is, the mating system needs to be considered, I would say. Although we think of the peer living as a, a social organization component. In our case, it is just the peer that reproduces with each other. Does that help? Is it, may, it may be easier for me to try to help if I, in asking your in asking the question, what is the goal? What are you trying to resolve? What are you trying to do that you find yourself challenged in not knowing how to do it because you, you need an answer for this? Yeah, um, it's more when I'm uh, so reading studies where, um, well, I would like to know if those individuals are living in pair or not, and I have home ranges uh, overlapping uh, or... Um, uh, yeah, I have... Okay, uh, now, uh, now I understand. I'm, I'm glad I, I asked the following. Right, right, so, so are, are we okay? Do we wanna construct an idea of pair living from home range data, for example? If the home ranges yeah. of a male and a female overlap, are we gonna call that pair living? Uh, that opens up a huge topic that we have all been talking and thinking about. Uh, and again, embracing, and I hope there will be some interest to, to talk about Atom 
embracing atom with openness and modesty, the home range data, even ours, it's, it, it's far from clear because we're combining all the home range data, regardless of what the animal was doing in the same bag. So again, I always like to go back to the examples that I give the students. Imagine that I plotted your home range and I came back with one single home range that includes your vacation destination, where you go, where you went dancing, dancing on Sunday, where you shop and where you sleep. And I put it all together and I said, this is your home range. But hold on a minute. I mean, for things that matter, which is where I study, sleep and eat, it's about a third of that. You're counting that time that we went dancing in the next neighborhood, we never go there. But for the owl monkeys, I admit it. The home range data, because we were not consistently, we have not, the whole room for improvement. I wish we could produce home, lay, home ranges that are based on socializing data, on eating data, on sleeping data. So now you have different layers, right? You, have a, you wanna build a multi-layer home range that distinguishes between the use of space that the animal makes for feeding or sleeping or mating or just prospecting. And then not to mention that you would like to have those layers also be temporal dependent because if you overlay the layers for the male and the female but they are not collected at the same time, then you have all kinds of issues. That's why I think it's so important that you ask yourself, what am I trying to do? Come to terms with the fact that any definition will be arbitrary. Even with all the pages we wrote about, about definitions, we're not claiming that this is an end to the discussion. These are definitions that we try to follow, that we gave us some, some power for, for compiling data, but they are as arbitrary as any other definition, only that we're trying to make them explicit. Uh, I think that we want to be thinking of, if we're looking at social evolution, the more, the closer we can get to something that tries to capture at least something related to the transmission of genes to the next generation would be important because that, that's what at the end we're trying to understand. We're trying to describe, speculate, hypothesize how some of these things may have evolved. Therefore, we need to be looking at the extent to which these phenotypes are likely to be more or less transmitted under one situation or the other. I lost you. Somebody, it's funny when, when somebody leaves, suddenly I'm looking at you there and then now, now you're there. <laughs> I'm there. Um, but I'm sure other people can comment on this as well. I mean, this is definitely things that we've spent hours and hours discussing with Tony and Machen and Sari. Um, Okay, you have questions from YouTube, Charlotte? Yeah. So the first one is from Clara B. Jones. Uh, do you find evidence of conflict between pairs? And uh, do you think that conflict is managed with vocalizations? Do I find evidence of conflict between pairs? Pairs, yeah. Yes, there is conflict. Uh, but I, I go back to the question that Suleyma asked. <clears throat> Again, it's so much easier to collect data on a male killing an infant or on two groups fighting, but we sometimes just see the two groups sitting literally three meters for, from each other, taking a happy nap and nothing happens. So there is conflict. The impression, and this was something that I asked all of the team members about two weeks ago, and they all kind of agreed. The impression we get is that the conflict between groups is much more ritualized along the lines of the dear enemy hypothesis. Yes, you may not like your neighbor. I have it so often. I mean, you have a little bit of, of, of an argument there, but the fence sets limits. And, and you're gonna go this much. I mean, you may yell at your neighbor, but you're not gonna go over the fence. So it's more of that kind. Whereas, and actually some of the calls and some of the most conspicuous, impressive displays that the owl monkeys make, which is sometimes very much like the titties. Some of you have seen the titties where they stand on two legs and they are arch a little bit their body and they, they, they swing the tail, they pile erect. That usually happens around 
groups encounters with other groups. And the second part was, do we think there's conflict? Yes. And do they manage that through vocalizations? Uh, yeah. There are vocalizations involved in many of the interactions between groups. How does, how does it change the interaction? Uh, those kinds of things where with observational data, I just don't know. Okay, and the second question was from um, Nelson Galvis. Does the distribution of the home ranges from the different groups is related with the genetic relationship? Is is related to uh, the with the genetic relationship? Is is the distribution of the sizes of the ranges of the groups related to genetic? This distribution relationship relationship yeah Re relationship of between between whom or genetic structure so i can try commenting on what we know of the ranges which is data that we worked a lot for all four taxa that we have studied there's a lot and, and takes us again to statistics and, and thoroughness and thoughtfulness there's a lot of variation in the size of the ranges just in those 18 ranges that I showed, the ranges vary from about four hectares to 11. So any argument you build around the size of the range being a determinant of certain form of social system, you have to address the variation in, in home range size. Uh, we have not found evidence that the size of the range is related in any obvious manner or biologically meaningful manner to the size of the group. Now, trying to go to the genetics that you asked me, I, I, I'm having a hard time understanding that part of the question. Uh, the genetic relationship. Can I interrupt uh, for a second, Eduardo? Yes. I, my interpretation of the question was, is there a lot of overlap between the pair or between members of the of the pair or related individuals. Okay, so the sure quite right, but thank, thank you, Nancy. So the ranges that we have graphed are ranges of groups. So we collect data because the Almanac groups are quite cohesive uh, for the purpose of these analyses for the Sakis, the TDs, and the Almanacs. We we feel comfortable at the scale that we're producing analysis to collect data on ranging for the group. We have never graphed, we have never actually analyzed the ranges of the male and the female. They would be, I mean, a huge, huge overlap. If anyone moves a little bit differently within the group, maybe those three, four year old sub adults who are beginning to kind of check the boundaries of, of the yard. But the male and the female, uh, we can see them very much overlapping. And so we produce a range for that group. Overlap between groups has, again, varies a lot. In the case of our monkeys, in the case of our estimates, overlap between the ranges of the groups varies between 10 and 40%. Now, and it also varies for the TDs and the Sakis. But again, I hope that over the next many years, we will be able to do more detailed analysis to see if we can get into the fine grained consideration of, of the nature of the ranging points. For the owl monkeys, eh, we feel quite comfortable stating that there's a core area. I mean, they have a range, which I said maybe between four and 11 hectares. But then there's a core area for which the overlap is much, much smaller. And something we would like to explore, which we haven't, is, is the core area that's more central to some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, from defense of sleeping sites, food, mates, uh, do you really feel threatened? Now you don't have a small house with a small backyard and you have a huge property with no fences. And, and as long, I mean, if, if people coming from town, going to the village or whatever, I mean, they ride through your acres of pasture, you're okay. But if they come closer to where you ha have the house, that's a different story. I mean, is there something of that going on with the Almanquis? We know that 
we, we proposed with some data that we collected for two years, that there was something about the food available in the core area that was different from the food available in the remaining of the range. But I think that all these questions, I think what we need to do for some of these questions is to fewer, again, it goes back to the natural history. It go, goes back to some of the conversations we've had about comparative studies. What if instead of trying to do 18 ranges, we decided that at least for two years, we're just gonna do in excruciating detail, two ranges and see what it gives us. And instead of saying, well, but that's only two. Okay, and the other is only 18. Since we never know what is enough, maybe there's something to be considered about that. For some questions, admitting the nature of our research, going much, much more in depth with fewer cases to see if it helps us identify new hypotheses or complete. What if I took two of those ranges and I replicated them now discriminating. I, every single time I get a location for ranging point, I'm going to make notes and I'm going to write down what the animals were doing. And I kind of get into the details of that. Will that be something different that may give us insights that we don't get from just doing home ranges and, and saying, okay, home ranges, they overlap. Well, tell me, how did you construct that home range? But of course, the press that all these things we realize once we've already collected the data, we're done with the study. That's why I'm looking forward. Now, those of us reviewing it, we say, yeah, we will publish this. We will not say, well, that's only two ranges, and, and Eduardo has already published ranges of 18. We will need to say, great, now we have the most comprehensive thorough description of a home range for an owl monkey with kinds of data, types of data, quality of data that nobody has ever published. It's worth publishing. And that's, that, now we're going from atom to atomic, for those of you who read the paper, meaning the IC stands for institutional change, change that cannot depend just on us, but has to depend on journals, promotion committees, universities, and all those things that unless we change that, we're not gonna be able to be more open, modest, and, and yeah, open and modest with, with what we can and cannot do. So we are at the official end of our time for questions and answers, but as there's nobody who wants to have the room after us, as we are virtually here, I suggest we just continue for those who do have time. Of course, many of you have to go for do something else. So we are not, um, so, uh, of course, we said when you leave, but we can understand. And if nothing is against it, I would just continue with the questions as long as the people are around and have time. And the next question is then from Lea Prox, please. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Lea Prox from the um, PhD student at the German Primate Center in Göttingen. And I was wondering, um, so the, also the partner of the animal who's being expelled has a disadvantage, you said. So they're, they're having less reproductive success if you look at the lifespan. So they shouldn't have any interest in getting a new mate. And then you also have, they live in pairs, but they also sometimes still have um, maturing uh, offspring. So it's like at least two individuals, sometimes three or more, as I understand it. And they're overrun by one floater which which throws individual out like how does this happen why is nobody doing anything like do that, any that's that's an interesting question and and i think it's that as 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 ethologists animal behaviorists i i suspect that you'll all appreciate if part of the answer draws from the richness of the observations and the details not from from summaries uh, yes groups can grow to have as many as six animals. And those are usually the offspring of the reproducing pair. Sometimes you get to seven, but that's usually only around the birth season. So you have a group of six, there's a new baby being born. And very soon after uh, somebody disperses, you're back to six or five. So it means that you can have animals who are three, four and five years of age in the same group as they have the reproducing pair. Uh, 
Maggie Corley, who did her PhD looking at the dispersal patterns, both the behavioral and endocrinological correlates of dispersal showed that the levels of PDG and E1C in females, at least in some of the females when they're four or five years of age, are of such level that it suggests they could have conceiving cycles. Still, we have no indication from potentially reproductive mature offspring in the group that they are showing behavioral sexual motivation or seeking copulation with, with any other individuals. Now, that's the first part. So yes, you could have animals in the group that it looks like. Now, a hormonal profile is not enough for you to conclude that the animal can conceive, right? But the hormonal profile suggests that some of them may. Now, how, do, how cannot they reject a floater? That's where I think that because at the end of the day, it probably comes down to one-on-one. -on -one. The fights, the turmoil, it is really three, four, five, six animals running like crazy on top of the canopy, animals falling to the ground. Uh, so my recollection from the many ones that I've seen is that everyone gets involved. You seldom just have one-on-one -on -one and the other one's watching. That, that's not how I, I see it. Now, but it is possible that eventually the stakes are much higher for one than the others, particularly if the floater targets the same sex resident adult. So it could be that after, after a while, the remaining members of the group just kind of pull back and, and, and observe. Uh, so the reason it, this could, I mean, it could lead to very specific predictions regarding what is it that the group is defending, right? If it were really food or a sleeping site, you would predict that more members of the group should be, should stay engaged. Unless nothing changes for you, because if you have a no male or a no female, I mean, you're just changing mouths. Instead of having this animal eat, I have this one, we still have, we're still five for a sleeping site. But uh, this is where I really think that we all benefit from. If anybody else in the project wanna comment on, on what is your natural history perspective or view on, on the extent to which, we, we see the juvenile, we see the sub-adults, getting excited and running and chasing. But if you guys, if anybody else in the project has natural history, kind of your own very personal views of why, how come the question Leah posed is, how come five monkeys cannot kick the hell out of a single floor? I think that it has to be because at some point it really comes down to one-on-one -on -one and the other ones do not remove themselves from the fight. Okay, then um, Adriana, your question, please. Hi, thanks Eduardo for such a nice talk. Um, I'm, my name is Adriana Maldonado and I'm a professor at Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. And my question is, it's kind of a, it kind of build up. So I, I'm, I think I missed it somehow. How long do these animals live? The longest uh, we have had animals who lived at least in the wild. I'm thinking of one guy who must have lived at least 17 years. Uh, I think there's one that we estimated had been around at least 19. We don't know much longer than that because we haven't been around that much. Again, these are the kinds of things that individual based studies. I mean, I'm going by the animals that I know when they were born and we follow them. Yeah. Okay, so, cause my question comes up, um, what's the average age at which a floater takes over a group? And how is it related to the first age in which they reproduce? And so, how long can they be resident after they take over a group? Thanks, so, no, no, these are important questions that have not come up before, a little bit of the life history of the animals. So I, I was very clear on the times when most of them disperse anywhere between three and five years. And then there's some time when they're floating. Uh, the data we have for the animals age at first reproduction, you're really talking around six years, the earliest. Very slow trajectory for an animal that only weighs three pounds 
on average 1.2 kilograms. So it takes them six years to start having babies. Now, it, given that about on average, about 70% of groups have infants per year. So I think it's a reasonable, I would have to go and look at the numbers, but I think it's a reasonable expectation that individuals will produce on average seven babies every 10 years. I'm not saying that most of them live that long in a group. Now, what, what is interesting is that these animals that live that long don't match. I don't know where we're looking at outliers, but if these were outliers, I would have to ask myself, why, why did we end up with the outliers having colors? Uh, but I'm trying to answer your question. So first, first age of reproduction between six and seven years. And from then on, the, the picture that we're putting together is that for the number of years, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, eight, you have babies. If not, 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 not always every other year, every year. But the impression we get is that when a pair forms, they produce babies every year. On average, I'm talking, and the groups grow to a size, and then problems begin. So we do think that there's something about the intergroup dynamics that may also be favoring these changes because we go a lot from groups of five or six to broom, a change in an adult. And I, when, when, when they, re, one of the conclusions I said that the floaters are having effects on some adults, not just on the animal they replace. It is quite common that the change of adults happens with all of some other changes in group composition. It is not that you just replace one, one piece of the puzzle. In replacing that piece of the puzzle, many times there is collateral damage. And, and juveniles and some adults disperse, or they die in the fight, or, or, or as consequence of the fight. Good. Then the next question is by Susan Perry. Hi. Um, I getting back to Leah's question. It's pretty similar to mine. I was really intrigued by these um, examples of these inadvertent experiments you did removing a mate. You know, in capuchins, uh, you know, we don't have monogamy, but it, it, we do have these really important bonds between the alpha male and all of the breeding females who are not his daughter. So he is basically monopolizing the breeding. And it's definitely to the female's reproductive advantage because of the extreme prevalence of infanticide for females to keep that male in place as long as possible. And speaking of this collateral damage, you know, what happens if you have a takeover is uh, these loyal sons of the former alpha, alpha start dispersing. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of death in, in the infant, so you don't have uh, play partners and co-dispersal partners. Uh, so it's really to everybody's advantage to keep that current alpha in place as long as possible. And this can last up to 18 years, the tenure in capuchins. Um, and so, uh, so I was really uh, curious whether when you have a case like this experimental case where you bring the male back and he's perfectly healthy, does that group really put up a fight to eject the guy who appeared yesterday and get their former alpha back? I mean, anecdotally, we do see that in, in capuchins where um, somebody has, has made a comeback. He's gone off and licked his wounds and tried to return. Mm. If it's been a long-term alpha, especially with, with whom they've had many offspring and have good relationships, they do seem to work at trying to get him back, as long as that happens within a reasonable time frame of the, um, the initial eviction. The, 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 the case that comes to mind first was a female Cecropia in a group, and she did not make it back. We actually found her dead a couple of days after we returned her to the group. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have that many cases because we stopped doing bringing the animals to camp. But the single case that I remember, and I doubted I would need Marcelo here because that was very early the project, 2003, 2004, none, none, of, of, none of the people who are attending the talk now were working in the forest back then. Uh, but the, the one that I remember, she did not. That's why we got so concerned. She mm -hmm. did not make it back. The other one that I think Tony was there, 2003, but that was different. That was we captured a sub-adult. Mm -hmm. And when we returned her to the group, her stepmom who did not let her back in. So the stepmom had moved. So she was in the group with biological father. Her mother 
got replaced. Uh, I know that, I mean, I remember this well because those were the years that I lived in the field. So is her, she had been living with her stepmom for, I want to say, nine months. And after we captured her and we released her, uh, the stepmom just gave her such a hard time, would not let her climb onto the onto the branches where they were resting. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was another very disappointing event because of course we were to blame for the fate of this sub-adult. I mean, she, she never made it back to the group. She ranged alone for some time and then we never, we stopped seeing her. I mean, she may have made it onto an art group, but she was not let in by her stepmom. Mm -hmm. And they had lived together for at least the, the course. I know because this happened in May. I, uh, yes, that is five, 10 months they have been living together. Mm -hmm. I so want to, if, if I can, I mean, Filippo had a question for the. Yeah, um, I am, Philip. since we're, we're now on the, in an unofficial time of question and answer, I hope I get to, so I, I'd love very much for Filippo to ask that question that you said you have about, for, I suspect it, it was for Ron or for me, but I definitely would love to hear other people's thoughts about this. Carsten was doing a fantastic job. I was next in line, uh, Eduardo, so it was perfect, oh. uh, the timing. <laughs> So it was, it was good. Uh, then I comment briefly on, on something that you were talking now, and then I go for the micro, a real question. I, I think this uh, uh, um, kind of uh, why seven or more individuals cannot defend against one coming, I think the seven individuals may have very different uh, uh, interests uh, and themselves. So not all of them want to defend. So they may want to have some change. Uh, and so that could be, a, that's why they don't necessarily uh, form a kind of a, a big coalition against the intruder, if you want. But that's a, I'll leave it there as, as a comment. I just want to, because uh, uh, there is in the chat a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, discussion on really getting more this in, insight from the statisticians. And my first uh, suggestion to all you, the, the three of you, the organize this series, maybe it would be good to invite Ron Wasserstein or any others to give a presentation of that topic that could be very good for us. And then we can have a discussion on that topic more fully. My is a simple uh, question for Ron is to, uh, or, or any others, I know the run is still on, uh, on the, on the, um, in the presentation, is just to give us insights using what you presented of, uh, let's say, his view uh, on, on the use and not use of uh, inference uh, in a statistical way, it use more the uncertainty uh, issue. So it's a very broad question, but I think will give us a more insight to overall to appreciate uh, what Eduardo was mentioning briefly towards the end. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I'm happy that the match extended into extra time so that I uh, got onto the field and uh, I'll play quickly. The, um, we would be happy to um, participate in a future gathering. Um, I, I know I'm not just speaking for myself. My colleague, uh, Alan Sherm is here. My colleague, Nicole Lazar was on the call for most of it left. Uh, she left just a little while ago. I would just say this much and then find out what a, um, uh, Alan wants to add to it. The, um, uh, uh, Filippo, in answer to your question, uh, what Eduardo did is the kind of thing that we're talking about, which is to um, uh, take the statistics and use them to help with the understanding of, the, uh, of what you're seeing uh, in the field, but without um, feeling the need to fall back on um, thresholds like P less than 0.05 or whatever to, to inform your decisions. You'll notice that um, Eduardo's talk was p-value free. Uh, there wasn't a one in there. Uh, it doesn't have to be p-value free, but what we would look for is sort of avoiding the urge to take those p-values, which may or may not make sense to begin with in the kind of complex data that you're computing, take those um, p-values and then uh, arbitrarily apply a threshold uh, to them. And, and, and Alan, maybe you'd like to add or dispute something I just said. Uh, no, I, I would certainly not dispute anything. Uh, 
What I would add is just a few points of emphasis in, from our papers. Uh, uh, you know, we argue for abandoning statistical significance. Uh, we do not, and I repeat, do not argue for abandoning uh, statistics. In fact, we argue for embracing statistics. Uh, likewise, we don't argue for abandoning p-values. Um, there, you know, there's some question about how strong they are as a statistical measure of evidence. But in any case, we say, you know, it's fine to present p-values. What we argue against is thresholding them uh, in any way, most typically 0.05, but uh, other thresholds are used in some other disciplines. Um, we argue that that's simply not useful um, and in fact detracts. Uh, I think the last thing that I would mention is uh, just encouraging exactly what Eduardo is doing in his talk and in the questions and answers, which is uh, accepting uncertainty. You know, the, the, fir the first part of our uh, ADAM acronym. Uh, and, uh, and that's having a fulsome discussion of all the sources of uncertainty. And to the extent it can be quanti made quantitative, that's fine, but that's not always possible. It often has to be qualitative. And, you know, in the, the Q&A, the discussion of the, the, the uncertainty introduced by not being able to always tell males and females apart. Um, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, that, that's an important source of uncertainty and should be an important part of the write-up of any results. And those of, with, of you with substantive expertise in this field could probably think of other such sources of uncertainty that should be discussed. And then, you know, that, that not only helps uh, highlight the limitations of any particular paper, but it can then, you know, very much strengthen future work of, oh, okay, here, here was a limitation of that study. Here's a way to address that. And, you know, Eduardo discussed the possibility, oh, let's maybe do a study that focuses on just two groups where we can do enhanced uh, observation that would reduce some of the, at least some of the sources of uncertainty that arise when we're looking at all 18 groups. So I just throw that out there. I, I just want to come in very common in relationship to data set we all handle. I mean, these are as simple as, so if you have data on age of dispersal of X number of males and X number of females that you know their sexes, this is something we have in our database. And you have a whole chunk of animals of unknown sex. So you can really qualify that uncertainty by running your models. And you, I'm not, I mean, Ron and Alan know that, of course, I, I, I went to an extreme of really minimizing the kind of mathematical statistics that I presented, but of course we do it. But in the case of age of this person, you may say, okay, I have hypothesis, and now you're gonna run your analysis with the, with the animals for which you know the sex, and then you can really model if all, these of, if, all, if all these unknown animals were of one sex or were of the other sex, I mean, just assign them randomly or by any biological informed criteria, guess the sex and see how your findings would change. So you can do that. That's, that's quantifying and bringing the uncertainty to bear on the conclusions. So you will listen, 50% of the animals, we didn't know the sex, but even when we run them this way or that way, even if we knew it, it does change, it doesn't change. We get a completely different story if now the proportion of male and females in the subset that we don't know, instead of where, instead of being 50-50, is 40-60. How robust are your findings to differences in the sex, in the proportion of sexes of those for which you do not know the sex? Now, this is very basic, but what that's what I'm saying, so much of what we need to do is a change of attitude. And it's not only on, on the authors, but it has to be in the reviewers and the editors, because I can guarantee if I do that, somebody's going to say, well, but we don't really need to know about those animals of unknown sex. Or, or now, of course, you can lie with statistics. If you don't tell that they are unknown, I just put them all together and you say, we have a hundred animals of known sex and unknown all together in the same bag. 
Well, that's what we do. That, that, that's the little things that we don't want to do. Be open that you have half of them which are unknown. And this is how they can change the story if, if I knew their sex. So thank you. I think we could discuss a lot about statistics, but I guess most people here would agree that p-values, um, there can be non-significant p-values of important results and significant ones that are nonsense. But I want to give now for the last question the time to um, Sofia Dorotovskaya, please. Uh, hi, I'm Sofia. Uh, I'm a PhD student from German Primate Center. And I was wondering about the um, what you said about infant survival and disappearance after the replacements. So I remember that you had a paper uh, where the survival and disappearance of infants didn't uh, differ after uh, after replacements or without replacements. And either I didn't understand something, or was it because you now have new data? Yeah. Replicability, exactly. Another thing that we are looking forward to do and we'd love to have people help us with that. So the paper you're referring to is the paper that we published with Maren, Children of Divorce. Mm -hmm. And that was a smaller data set. And I was asking Maren about this or either Maren or, or Alba. It looks like some of the, we, we need to go back and compare the analysis as we did them then and, and the analysis as we're doing them now. And I know that Alba, she told me she's talking to one of her committee members who's asking her to redo some analysis. So I need to ask for your patience to figure out if exactly the difference in the patterns we can attribute to now a different data set, or we have to be extremely careful making sure that just a minor change in how we were classifying certain data is not responsible for this. But you're absolutely right. The data, the results that I'm showing now are different from the story we got many years ago with Maren's paper. And this is the kind of thing that instead of seeing them as conflict, we need to see them as this, this is what happens when you get new data sets. It, it speaks of replicability. And I was, again, preparing for the talk. I was talking to Claudia McGuire and said, why do people think that we never hear in behavioral ecology about issues of retraction, lack of replicability, all of the problems that we see for disciplines where decisions are related to lives or money have had all kinds of problems. So give me the hypothesis, why do we don't hear about those in our discipline? That they don't happen or that there's no cost to make them or benefits to identify them. They need to be happening. If we were to replicate all of the studies ever conducted on, on field primatology, do you really think that we're not gonna find all kinds of different, I mean, if we studied all over again, we would not find the same outcome. The only problem is that because whether my estimates of grooming of the male to the female are 30% or 80% change nobody's life, who, who is gonna bother? to replicate that. It's only, it's our passion for knowledge. It's our passion for getting right. It, that's the only drive we have. Nobody's gonna ask to retract me the, the paper because they found that, oh gee, this new data says that what he said before is wrong. We, we have to do it out of our own will to learn, which is challenging. There's no cost to us having the same problems that clinical psychology has, or I mean, if people err on predicting the hurricane or this year's election, they'll be in the cover of a newspaper. We don't get there. So there are no cause for us, but the problems have to be in our disciplines as well. So it's great that you brought up this. I think we have a situation of, it may be worth to discuss them together. We replicate and now something different. Well, we shouldn't be surprised of that. But Eduardo, we have had um, cases of retractions and issues that have come up in behavioral ecology that yeah. we shouldn't forget about. <laughs> You're right. 
So thank you, everyone. I'm going to finish a live screen now, which doesn't mean we have to stop the discussion, but just to let you know. And because of this, I would also like to say again, thank you very much, Eduardo, for a fantastic talk. And thank you for everyone for our very lively discussion and hope to see all of you or many of you next week at Aaron Sandals' talk. So I'm stopping the live screen.